Welcome to Gospel Preaching, a presentation of Gospel Time Ministries Incorporated. I'm Dave Rigg, coming your way from my home about six miles north of Albion, Illinois. If you have a Bible handy today, turn with me to the book of Job. In the Old Testament, the book of Job, I'm going to read just one verse today as the uh, text for my message to you. It's Job chapter 38 and verse 22, reading from the New King James translation of the original Hebrew text. Have you entered the treasury of snow, or have you seen the treasury of hail? Would you pause just a moment with me for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask now for your blessing on the reading of the Holy Word. I pray for your guidance, Lord, through the Holy Spirit within me, that I might deliver this message today you laid upon my heart for this day in the way that you want it to be spoken. And I pray, Lord, that all who watch this message, each person might get from it exactly what you have for him or her to not only gain, but to put to action in their lives. This I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. How many of you folks remember the great blizzard of 1978. It's one of the most severe blizzards in the history of the United States. And tomorrow marks the 42nd anniversary of that terrible, terrible storm. On Tuesday, January 24th in 1978, a moisture-laden gulf low developed over the southern states while a separate low-pressure system was developing over the upper Midwest. The storm initially started in the form of, well, rain, some light rain, and then it quickly changed to heavy snow during the night as Arctic air deepened ahead of this storm. Particularly hard hit by this blizzard of 1978, would have been, of course been Illinois, which is where I live, but also it extended over into the state of Indiana, down into the state of Kentucky, up north into Michigan, and eastward towards Ohio, and into southeastern Wisconsin. So you can see that this was a blizzard that was not just localized, but was over a wide area of our country. I did a little research on this, and I, now first let me say, I was, I was here and I experienced it. I well remember it. But, you know, sometimes we forget some of the facts and details. So I did a little research on it. And I found out that in this great blizzard of 1978, there were wind gusts recorded of up to 100 miles per hour. And, of course, that caused huge, and I mean huge, snow drifts to develop. Some of them measured anywhere from 15 to 25 feet in depth. And, of course, with the cold temperatures and the wind blowing that strong, the wind chill values in some places reached as low as 60 below zero. The powerful winds coupled with the snow, as, of course, those of you who were alive at that time remember, caused a lot of great complications. Trees and many miles of electric power lines were blown down. And as a result, of course, homes and businesses were left without power and heat as well. The huge drifts brought nearly all means of transportation to a stop for about a 24-hour period. Cars were easily buried with sometimes individuals still inside, and, of course, there were many cars and trucks and vehicles left stranded out on the roads. Numerous closures of the interstates and highways resulted because of this terrible, terrible blizzard. And these prolonged highway closures, of course, resulted in shortages of food and other necessities of life. Stores that could have been open probably weren't open, but if they could, 
they quickly ran out of food before the storm really got bad. As you might imagine, a lot of people ran to the store and get the usual milk and bread and other necessities. Nearly uh, all of the schools were closed. Because of the impending uh, bad storm, many of the schools uh, were dismissed early so that uh, the buses could get the kids home before the worst part hit. But by the 26th, a couple of days later, of course, there was no way for the kids to get to school. And as you might expect, some people died. The death toll from this epic winter storm of 1978 rose to over 70 people losing their lives over this uh, wide area where this blizzard hit. And I got to tell you, I remember that blizzard very well, 1978. My wife, Pat, at that time was a registered nurse working at the hospital up in Olney. And the snow drifts made it impossible for her to get home that night. She was working the uh, uh, 3 to 11 or 12 shift. And by the time her shift ended, why, by that time the roads were impassable. And so she had to stay in Olney. In fact, as I remember, she uh, had to stay in Olney for about three days. And uh, that's because there was not only bad roads everywhere, but there was a huge, I mean a huge snow drift over Highway 130, not too far north of where I live. And it took bulldozers to eventually get the highways open to traffic again. And even after that, Pat's brother Jim had to go get her with his four-wheel drive vehicle. Now, getting back to our Bible passage for today, as I read it to you, it was from Job chapter 38, verse 22. It says, Have you entered the treasury of snow? Now, my guess, some of you are thinking to yourself, isn't that kind of an odd verse? Well, yeah, it is in a way. So what could God mean by his encouragement to us to enter into the treasury of snow? What could he possibly mean by that? I got to say this, I certainly did not enjoy the blizzard of 1978, but I do enjoy going rabbit hunting, quail hunting, or at least I used to when I was younger. I'm getting a little older now, and I'm probably not going to do much of that if ever again. But boy, when I was younger, I loved to go rabbit hunting and quail hunting, especially after a snow. I love the scenery of the snowfall. Even though I might not go hunting now, I like whenever it does snow and it covers the ground. I love it. I think that's beautiful. So here's what I think God was trying to say to us about the treasury of the snow. Some of God's greatest riches, treasures, are found in the snow. Now, I know that sounds strange, but hang in there with me, okay? Point number one, the snow offers the treasury of purity. The snow offers the treasury of purity. When snowflakes fall, they act as a filters of the air. Did you know that? That's right. As those snowflakes are coming down, they are filtering things out of the air. Uh, they, they actually, snowflakes form over very minute little particles of dust and uh, debris and germs. And that snowflake coming down, in effect, purifies the air that you and I breathe. Did you know that there are more sick people down in the southern states during the winter than up here in the north? I found that on the internet. I didn't know that personally. But when I saw that, I, hey, I got to include that in my message. And, and why is that, that during the winter, more people get sick with colds and things like that down in the southern states than up here in the north? Well, I think it's this. Snowflakes actually attach themselves to things in the air. Snow also leaves a blanket of pure white over everything we know. And it certainly, when snow falls and it covers the ground, it, it covers up even the most desolate landscapes. 
and causes them to look like things of beauty. And Job understand that purity was one of the purposes that God is trying to accomplish in our lives. He says in Job 23.10, But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Well, friends, God is still in the business of purifying his people. Psalm 51.7 says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be, what is it? Whiter than snow. Listen to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as, what? Snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So the first point I made to you is, The snow offers the treasury of purity. Now let's move on to point number two. The snow offers the treasury of power. The snow offers the treasury of power. Now the word treasure here in Job chapter 38 verse 22, remember I've told you this before, the Old Testament was originally written in the Hebrew or Aramaic language, and the New Testament written in the Greek language, not in the English language that you and I read today. So when we go back to the original Hebrew, that word that was translated into our English word treasurer is otsal, otsal, okay? And it literally, figuratively translates out to the word an armory. Now, although snowflakes are very, very tiny and very small, When enough of those snowflakes band together, we have seen that they have the power to shut down an entire city, an entire state, an entire region of the Midwest to be shut down when those snowflakes band together in drifts. So there is power even in a little snowflake. We saw what happened there in the blizzard of 1978. And you know, God sometimes allows storms to develop in our lives. And why? I think probably there are several reasons, but one reason that comes to my mind quickly is God allows storms in our lives to slow us down, to stop us long enough to think about Him and to acknowledge Him and reach out to Him. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Well, there's no doubt about it. That blizzard in 1978 sure forced us to slow down and to do just that. Unable to go anywhere. Unable to do our normal activities. We were forced to make some radical changes in our lives. Those who had livestock had a difficult time getting out there uh, feeding and watering and keeping their livestock alive. Those who had uh, things that had to be done, like getting, if they worked in a hospital or, or the police or so on, they still had to try their very best to get out, and it wasn't easy. And because there was no electricity in the house, that meant there was no television for us to watch. And those who had the Pong, not the sophisticated video games we have today, back in 1978, but those who may have had Atari or some of those other games, they couldn't play those. The kids, as I remember, the kids were very restless. It was hard to find things uh, to occupy the kids' times because the normal things that they would do, they couldn't do them. And, of course, (laughs) with no electricity, there was... No lights, and so we had to look for candles and and oil lamps and so on, lanterns to to get by. If you were alive in 70, you remember all this. And sometimes all we could do is just kind of sit around and maybe read a book or read the Bible maybe, or spend some time in prayer. God keep us safe during this terrible blizzard. Well, let's move on to point number three. The snow offers the treasury of peculiarity, peculiarity. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. For who makes you differ from another? 
And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Now, that moves me into the verse in Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And then 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, in some of these verses I just read to you, I used the New King James translation, but if you were reading the King James version of those verses, you would notice that it says a peculiar people. Now, I have to admit that in my 30-some years of being a church pastor, I've met some very peculiar church people, and you probably have too. But what this means is God has called us to be a peculiar type of people. Now, did you know this? Maybe you have, because I've heard it before, and I'm not sure it's true, but it has been said that no two snowflakes are ever alike. That in spite of the millions and billions of snowflakes that form when you're building a snowman, for instance, not one of them is exactly like another. Now, I've never gotten down with a microscope or a, a magnifying glass and tried to prove whether that's true or not, but, but you get on the internet and you'll find that said, that no two snowflakes are ever exactly the same. Well, that's an example of the power and the personality of God. Of the more than five billion people now living upon the face of this earth, not one of them is exactly like another. Now, we run into some uh, twins sometimes. I remember uh, years ago there were twin sisters in the church that I was a pastor. And some people in my church couldn't tell them apart, but I could. I could see a little difference in the face of one of these girls compared to the other. But some people couldn't see it. But it's been said, and I believe it's true, no other person in the face of the whole wide world is exactly like you. And again, even biological twins are different in many ways. Now, this guy Job that we're looking at today in our Bible text, he had trouble understanding why he was suffering more than other people around him, especially since Job had tried his very best to live a life that was pleasing to God. So God reminded Job that since we are all different, he must sometimes deal with us differently. Did you get that? Because we're all different, God sometimes has to do or deal with us individually in a different way. Well, let's move on to point number four. Yeah, I've got four points today. Point number four, the snow offers the treasury of patience. Patience. Apparently, it takes time for a snowflake to be created. The conditions must be just right in order for snowflakes to form. And Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Now, please understand this, folks. God is indeed actively and patiently working in each and every one of us. That is, if we are a born-again Christian. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So you see, God actually develops us and he shapes us according to his desire for our lives. Years ago, the Hemphills recorded a Southern Gospel song, and it goes like this. God's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars. 
the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How kind and impatient he must be. God's still working on me. I know you didn't enjoy my singing, but you get the idea. So while God is working on our lives, friends, we must be patient. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Just be patient, friends, as you allow God to form you and make you into the image that he wants you to be. I've got a fifth point today. Point number five, the snow offers the treasury of perfection. The snow offers the treasury of perfection. Now, again, I'm, I'm going by what I read off the internet, and not just any old blog that anybody put together, but by scientific uh, research labs and so on, what they have found. And I found this out. If you did look at a microscope, uh, at a snowflake under a microscope, you would see that each snowflake is perfect in shape. In other words, not one side is, is smaller than the other side, or one side has three or four little uh, appendages breaking off and only two over here. Each snowflake is, uh, for lack of a better word, symmetrical, okay? Job 23.10, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. I think I shared that with you a little while ago. But then Psalm 138, verse 8, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. Now, I know there's no way that you and I are perfect now. But the good news is, friend, God is still working on us. James 1, 4, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And then in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, the Apostle Paul says, Not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Well, the time's running short, so I better wrap this up. I want to say this. I am very thankful for the opportunity to come each week here on Gospel Preaching and on YouTube with a message for you folks from God's Word. And Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 says this, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. Yes, we are all sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We are saved by grace through faith. And yet Psalm 51, 7 says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Isaiah 1, 18 tells us that just like a new blanket of snow, it covers the ugliness of dirt, stains, and filth in our lives, and we can live beautiful lives for the glory of Jesus. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. So as we think about the coming anniversary and again, if I remember my notes correctly, 42 years ago, starting tomorrow, the great blizzard of 1978 came upon us. And uh, many of us remember that well. So may we all, 
as we find here in the book of Job, experience the treasures of the snow. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for the opportunity to come each week this way over gospel preaching and YouTube with these messages you lay upon my heart. I pray, Lord, now as it goes out all over the world on the internet and that you might use it for each person who watches and listens to get from this message today what you have intended for him or for her. This I pray in Jesus' name and amen. Well, again, thank you for watching today. Lord willing, I'll be back again next week at this same time with another message from God's Word. Hope you're telling other people about these messages. Uh, all of the messages I've uh, preached here since I began this series back in, I believe it was May of uh, 2020, they're all there on Facebook and on YouTube, so you can go back and maybe look for a message that you think, according to the title, might be helpful to you or to somebody else, and that you'll uh, share these with other people so they can uh, watch and listen to. Okay? All right. So hopefully we'll be back here again, Lord willing, next Sunday, and you'll be watching as well. In the meantime, may God richly bless you.